The difference between the digital age, however, and the pre-digital age, let's call it post-industrial but pre-digital age, is that in the pre-digital age, it cost a heck of a lot of money. Capital was usually the principal barrier to entry for people who had great ideas. I have a great idea, you know, I think I've, I've figured out a, a, a better way to build a mousetrap or a better way, you know, to have an in, internal combustion engine or whatever it is I figured out. But now I need the resources to put my ideas to the test. And, you know, finding those resources and finding someone who would back you was a much, much more formidable process in the pre-digital age than it is today. And there are a couple of reasons for that. The first is, and both of them relate to the onset of, of, of so-called digital technology, which I probably should have started here. You know, what's different about digital technology than, than previous technologies? It's really the ability to, to reduce anything that can be carried by voice, by video, or any form of data to sort of electronic impulses that can be sent and then reassembled at the speed of light anywhere in the world instantaneously, right? So that, that you know, in the old days where, where you, I, I, as you heard, I went to undergraduate school in Hawaii. And I remember distinctly uh, back in the days, this was in the 60s, they had tape delay for the football games and big, you know, the you know, race that was just run on Saturday, the Kentucky Derby. So you would have to lock yourself in your dorm room and have no contact with any living person for 24 hours if you wanted to sort of see an event that was broadcast live here in the United States you know, in real time in Hawaii because otherwise somebody would tell you who won the Derby or something like that, they'd all be ruined. And that was because we didn't have the technology that could move video around the world. It went by antennas, right? Um, and the same was true for voice and the same was true for data. And so we've had you know, years and years of putting in very expensive infrastructure to move these things around. Then along comes digital technology where, where, where images, where voices, where sounds, where text can all be reduced to electronic impulses packaged and sent anywhere in the world like that. So that technology has had two profound effects on the availability of capital to entrepreneurs. The first is it gave rise to what I'll call the, the venture capital industry. Um, as people began to understand that there was a whole new wave of technology coming along that, that would enable clever entrepreneurs to create new business forms and new business models um, from scratch, a group of investors said, you know what we need to do? We have, we have to start making capital more available at the very early end of these business enterprises, creating these business enterprises, so that we can nurture them and grow them into full-fledged businesses. So you don't have to deal with a bank anymore or a classic traditional source of capital. You had a whole new group of people, uh, one of whom was Lawrence Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller's brother, who founded something called Venrock, which was one of the first venture capital firms um, focused on nascent businesses built around, built, building around new technology. And so that was the source of funding for companies that are household names today. Intel, which was one. Uh, Apple was one of their early uh, investments. So that industry, which got its start in the 70s, is now in full flight. It's a mature industry. There is, you know, there are established venture firms around that look to put capital in ideas at early stages, whereas that was not the case prior to, to these venture capitalists coming along. But the second phenomenon, and one that is, I think, even more powerful, is that the technology itself has obviated the need for a lot of capital. And by that I mean, uh, I'll give you some historic examples, and I'll give you one that, that's very current and that really makes the point. Um, for a good while after our merger with AOL, Steve Case and I would sort of, were, you know, were partners. He was the chairman, I was the CEO. And he would talk about the difference between how he built AOL and how Time Warner built all of its other, I'll call them analog businesses. You know, the rule, for example, in the magazine business, it's always been it takes a magazine about five years 
to get to profitability because you have a lot of upfront expense. You have to writers, uh, the printing and manufacturing process for the magazines themselves is expensive. You have to get distribution in. You have to build a subscribership over time and get some advertisers. And if you're breaking even or turning into the black after five years, you're about on the industry average.